All right, uh, now it's going to be the hour for uh, body and cancer imaging. We're going to switch uh, subjects a little bit, uh, hopefully still interesting. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker for uh, the body and cancer uh, imaging, uh, uh, Dr. Mark Griswold, uh, who is uh, setting up his computer here. So Mark Griswold a, is a physicist, actually, a renowned physicist. He is currently... Uh, professor uh, of in the Department of Radiology and Bioengineering at Case Western uh, in Cleveland, and uh, Mark has been really uh, you know pioneer in quantitative MRI and also in fast MRI uh, you know uh, development and also in uh, translational applications. And uh, he he was the last author actually in a very important paper, seminal paper. Uh, looking at MRI fingerprinting in nature uh, medicine in 2013, I believe, 2012. And I think he's going to talk about MRI fingerprinting uh, in his talk. And I think this is really a transformative way of approaching uh, MRI acquisition uh, for body imaging and also outside body imaging for neuroimaging. So we'll be really uh, delighted to have him talk to us today about MRI fingerprinting. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, Zahi and... and Everybody who organized this, in particular Chris, who uh, had to do an amazing amount of emailing to get me to, to organize this, and I really appreciate his time and effort in doing that. Um, I just want to remind everybody that Singapore uh, ISMRM meeting is in a few weeks, and I hope to, to see you all there. So I, I'm going to talk uh, about fingerprinting, but I, I want to start with some philosophy first, uh, because I think if you understand the philosophy, then the, the physics of it actually gets pretty simple. Um, and I'm going to start actually with, with weather. So um, I had to go to, to Rio last year, and um, this was the weather on the day that I left. Uh, so the, the, the black dot is where I left in Cleveland, and it was almost the same temperature it was in the North Pole. And Rio, which is uh, you know down here in Brazil, was uh, one of the hottest places on the planet that day. Um, and so if, if we think about it, I, I think everybody in the room could agree that Cleveland was cold. Um, and everybody could agree that uh, Rio was hot. Um, but some of these uh, words that we use depend a little bit on, you know, where we live. So my family's in Texas, and they thought this was really cold. Um, and uh, my friends in Cleveland thought this was really hot. Um, but if you ask this guy, he might think, eh, that's kind of normal. It might be hot for him. I don't think this is surprising for everybody. We also know that there's this global change in temperature that's happened over many, many years. Um, but I would argue that most of us aren't really sensitive to this. If I asked you what the temperature was uh, on April 22nd last year, I think you would have a real challenge in trying to do that. And especially if I asked you that over the last 10 years, you would have almost no idea what the temperature was. So just to abstract this a little bit, we use words to describe our situations in life still. And the, the, the words that we use depend on the people. People use different words depending on their individual experiences. We're also different people, so those words that we use are not reproducible. Um, we're also not sensitive to global changes. And uh, I think that this is true in all of our lives. I don't think any of this is surprising. Um, and this is why we use things called numbers to describe our world, because the numbers actually allow us to make good decisions. So if I told you the temperature was 22 degrees or 20 degrees, it would, uh, it would tell you whether or not you need to wear a coat. Um, the subjective feelings of, hey, it's, it's really hot, you might want to wear a coat, may be different depending on, or it's really cold, you may want to wear a coat. Uh, those may not be the same for all of us. I don't think this is surprising, but yet when we look at the way we do MR today, it's really not too different from that. So a radiologist will look at this image and they'll say, hey, this spot up here is too bright. It's hyper intense on flare. But I, the argument I'm gonna make for the rest of this session is um, what does that really mean? You could ask some very simple questions. Does the brightness on this image correspond to disease? And the answer is no, because the brightest thing in the image is actually the subcutaneous fat. Um, does the brightness correspond to the severity of disease? We know that's also not true. Is the brightness in the sense of the numbers that exist on this image in your PAC system, are they reproducible from day to day to day? 
site to site to site, technologist to technologist, scanner to scanner, no, all the way across the board. So we're essentially doing what I talked about with the weather. We're saying something is hot or cold, but with no basis in numbers. And we know that these numbers would allow us to make better decisions because the rest of our lives, this is true. Um, but this is really difficult in MR. On the other hand, I actually think that there's some really, really valuable numbers that we could get. So we, I'm going to spend most of the talk um, talking about T1 and T2. These are these fundamental relaxation parameters in MR. And they really do get to the fundamental structures of the tissues that we're dealing with. So T1 tells us at, at some level about the number of proteins or the concentration of proteins and the membranes that are there, while T2 tells us how much um, freedom water has to move around in the cells or around the cells. So in a way, these are, as I said, molecular level probes of tissue, but getting at these is really difficult. So as I said, these are exponential relaxation times of our magnetic signal that we measure in MR. And because it's an exponential and not a linear function, if we were going to map this out, we would typically have to take 5 to 15 different measurements along the time course for T1 and for T2. And traditionally, that's how we've arrived at these numbers. Now, if we look at that, that means that um, because we're taking 5 to 10 or 15 images, that means 5 to 10 times as long to scan if we did it kind of traditionally. Now, any of you who work in a clinic know that that's not going to happen. No patient's going to go from their hour-long slot or half-hour-long slot to, to being there most of the day. So this is why we rely on a single image, a weighted image. That's a qualitative um, idea of these parameters. But there's nothing quantitative really about them other than size and shape, as Bruce really elegantly talked about this morning. And I would argue that this has real impact. So a patient comes in, they have a lesion like this. Um, it's pretty easy to see, but we have no idea what it is. So it could be a MET that originated from somewhere else in the body, or it could be any one of a number of primary lesions that started in the brain. And the treatment pathways there are totally different. And so the first thing you've got to do today is you've got to do a biopsy. So a brain biopsy is done in an OR, you need an anesthesiologist and a neurosurgeon because they're going to drill a hole in your skull and then stick a needle in and take some tissue out. Because you have a hole in your head, you're going to spend a day in the ICU. The cost in 2013 for this procedure was twelve to $51,000, and this is just to figure out what's inside. This is absurd, if you ask me. And we, we fundamentally in our lab believe that these kinds of procedures have to go away. This has got to change. And so this has been a process that we've been doing in our group since 2003. So a whole bunch of us were in Germany at the time, in Würzburg, Germany. So this is Vikas Gulani, Nicole Seiberlich, and Peter Schmidt. This has been the, the team that has worked on this for now over a decade with this really fundamental statement that we say all the time that every biopsy is an imaging failure. We should not be sticking needles in people to find out what they have. We have imaging equipment, and that should tell us what to do. Shouldn't have to be cutting people open to, to figure stuff out. Um, and it's really easy to say. It's really, really hard to do. So we spent a, a good part of a decade trying all kinds of fast imaging methods and, and, and basically taking all of our physics and engineering knowledge to try to do this in a clinically reproducible way. And I can tell you flat out we failed. Um, and we failed for some pretty simple reasons in retrospect. But um, they're the same failures that have plagued our field forever. And it comes down to something as simple as the these three curves. If you look at every experiment that we do in MR, except for some recently, they've all followed one of these three shapes. We deal with a decay, uh, an exponential decay, an exponential recovery, or we do everything in our power to make sure the signal stays flat. Those are essentially all the, the types of experiments that we've done. And so let's just say we were going to measure T1. We have to measure a curve like this. So the, the, again, the problem that I talked about is the fact that imaging isn't fast enough, so we can't put enough points on the curve. Well, we have 
lots of experience on how to go fast, but what happens in these kinds of experiments is that every time you add something to go faster, the fundamental signal curve that you're fitting changes. And so we understood that, so we said, well, why don't we just add a correction? Well, if you're gonna stay in a clinically feasible time to acquire the correction, guess what, you have to go faster, guess what, your curve changes even more, and you go down this decade-long path where you get no answer. And you never, you actually never get something that, that works for real. And so we stepped back and, and we're really frustrated and said, wait a minute, why in the world are we trying to map those curves? Why are we doing this? What is so special about these three curves? And it's the process of asking that question that gets you to the next level because there is nothing special about those three curves. It is just because we've always done it that way. And that's the worst answer in science that you could ever get, right? So we, we threw this away and we asked, is there a different way? And what you realize now is that we could potentially generate any shape curve we want and just do it randomly. And our only um, constraint when we do this is that we have to make it in a way where different tissues look different. And this is the fundamental concept of this, this magnetic resonance fingerprinting, that I'm gonna do a randomized type acquisition and all I care about is that I can tell different tissues from one another. The actual shape doesn't matter to me. I can use pattern recognition based on quantum mechanics to, to pull out what I actually care about, which is the information about T1, T2, and so on. Now we called this fingerprinting because it's a direct analog to conventional fingerprinting. So that image on the left is actually just a bunch of random black and white lines. It tells us nothing. What gets us the information that I care about is actually a database where the FBI or whoever stores all the, the fingerprints and the information comes through the matching process to that database. This is where we get the name, phone number, and so on, which we actually care about. Same thing in MR fingerprinting. We run some random acquisition sequence. We get some random looking signal evolution. I have no idea what this means, but based on the block equations or some sort of quantum mechanical signal model, I can generate a full database of everything that I would expect to see from first principles. I can do a match and then I can get the T1, T2, and so on of the tissue that made up that dictionary. Now, I wanna just reemphasize, there's only two things that I care about in this framework. There's one that we call temporal incoherence, and this is this ability to tell different signal evolutions apart, so different tissues look different. The other is that I have to be able to tell different spatial locations apart to be able to make an image. So I need the left side to look different than the right side, for example. So this first part we can get, as I said, by randomizing the acquisition or by at least varying it throughout the acquisition to make those tissues look different. Spatial incoherence, we actually know from, from many years that we can get through randomized spatial encoding. So we could do randomized case-based trajectories. So our first foray into this actually relied on one of those first developments from over 10 years ago, the inversion recovery true FISP sequence, where we have a uh, inversion pulse, but instead of having a constant flip angle series, we randomized the flip angles and we randomized the TRs. In our first proof of principle, we actually did this two different ways. So the, the flip angles on the top and the TRs on the bottom, you can see that we have um, smoothly varying TR a little bit on the top in A, randomly varying uh, sorry, smooth, smooth uh, flip angle, really Gaussian TR over here. And in sequence B, we had a very smooth sinusoidal almost variation in the, in the uh, flip angle. And the TR is something Perlin noise, which is a smooth noise. Um, so we, we have sequence A and sequence B. We take one of those that we're going to run, and then we calculate a dictionary. So we can do this based on first principles, as I said. We start with a defined T1 and T2 value that covers the range of everything that we would expect in biology. We then input our sequence, run it through the block equations, then we get a dictionary, again, of everything that we would expect to see. 
So sequence A looks like on the left, sequence B looks, uh, is on the right. And you can see that we get very different looking signal evolutions for different tissue types. So we've met our temporal incoherence criteria. The other thing that you can note here is that the magnetization level is really high. So in a traditional MR experiment, you're typically looking at differences on the order of a percent or so of magnetization. And here we're getting differences that are on the order of, of a tenth of the full uh, available magnetization, if not more. The other thing is that we never approach a steady state, so we can continue scanning forever and continually add new information. So you put all of this together and we end up with an efficiency that is very, very high. So if we take a phantom and we put it in, in the magnet, we get very nice matches whether we run sequence A or sequence B. Then to run this in vivo, we do an undersampled spiral acquisition um, with a randomized rotation depending on how we implement it. And when we do that, we get individual time frames that look like the image up there on the left, which doesn't tell us really much of any information. Um, we get this randomized looking curve in blue here, but a computer can make the match between that and the dictionary, which is the, the red curve there. And when we do that, we get these four quantitative parameters out, T1, T2, the off resonance and the spin density, all from a, uh, this is a 12 second acquisition at that time. So we've spent a lot of time trying to visualize these pieces of information, um, you, nobody in my experience is really used to looking at maps, we're used to looking at weighted images. Um, and so we display these sometimes as grayscale and sometimes on these colored maps, we're still doing a lot of um, work trying to visualize these things correctly. But again, the overall message is that we're getting multi-dimensional quantitative information at the same time. So if we're gonna implement this in practice, um, we have to show that this is stable. So we've been working with the phantom from NIST and the ISMRM. Um, so this is the same phantom scanned consecutively over 35 days, um, one minute acquisition time. You can see that we get about a 3% variation at maximum across this whole range. Um, this has now been repeated at um, five sites, four different cities, um, using a f an official Siemens implementation now again, around 3% variation on average between the different sites. Um, based on this, we've done a, a study in normals or, or otherwise normal people across the age range from 11 to I believe it's 74 um, or 72, thank you. Um, and we've done simple things like repeatability studies in these people without controlling for anything, their sleep, their, 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 what they've eaten, drank or anything. Um, we put them in the magnet, do a measurement, it's about 45 second measurement, pull them out, put them back in, do it again five minutes later, and then have them come back a week later. Um, and what you can see is that this is just the T1 and superior frontal white matter. We get a very tight reproducibility between the different um, scan sessions. And it's probably um, tight enough that we can say that this difference between subject three and subject five may be related to biology. And this range of difference in T1 is way smaller than what you would visualize on a T1 weighted scan. The first second that a radiologist would get this into a reading room, they would re-window those five scans so that they all looked the same. This is within that range where, where it would all appear normal. Um, but with the sensitivity that we've got, we may be able to see differences in biology. Um, so some of the things that we did uh, pull out of this study are significant um, trends in age in some regions. Some of these trends uh, had a better fit to a linear model, some were quadratic. We also were able to pull apart age, uh, gender differences um, between uh, different regions of the brain. I have to say as a male, uh, all of these indicate faster degeneration, which bothered me, but um, these were all significant trends. Just moving back to some of the technical develops, this year at ISMRM we'll show some 3D scans. So this is uh, 1.2 by 1.2 by 3 millimeters uh, acquired over the whole brain in 12 minutes. This is work by Dan Ma, so that's T1 and T2. Again, because they're acquired at the same time, they're perfectly co-registered. Um, and, and because of the increased resolution, I feel comfortable showing you guys coronal reformats of that data, T1 and T2 again. 
So that's, in my mind, clinical, um, clinically viable resolution in 12 minutes. I mean, we have just used some very minor parallel imaging acceleration here to, to make this happen. This is at 3T, by the way. Um, so uh, we did get this in Nature a couple years ago, and one of the funny things about um, getting data published in Nature is that the tabloids pick it up. Um, and so this uh, is maybe my claim to fame. Um, so they, they, they picked this up the day after, and of course, based on no data, they say that this method at the time could, could uh, spot cancer in seconds. Of, of course, they put us next to a CT scanner. <laughs> um, but I did get on the same page as Kate Middleton, which probably won't ever happen again. So. Um, but over the, the, the intervening years, we have started to see these differences in cancer. So um, this is contralateral white matter, GBMs, oligos, and, and METs. And you can start to see a spread just based on the T1 and T2 values here of these tumors. Um, in particular, we're, we're starting to look at doing textural and histogram analysis of these. And um, this is uh, slightly old data. I didn't have the newer slide. But um, in particular, we're seeing uh, significant differences in the paratumoral, paratumoral regions between different types of tumors. And so it's, it's not going to be just the analysis of the tumor body itself, but how the, the brain tissue around it is, uh, is reacting that I think will, will provide us really a lot of information here, in particular looking at treatment response. Um, another area that um, we find is really promising for fingerprinting is actually in the prostate. We already do a semi-quantitative uh, exam in the prostate here as well, but just in a very simple less than five minute scan now, we can uh, get T1, T2, and then a separate diffusion scan. And uh, we see significant differences um, between cancer and not cancer. Um, and the, here the, the uh, dark bars are targeted biopsy. These are non-targeted biopsies. It, it doesn't matter which patient population you look at. We're getting a three-dimensional separation of these um, uh, from, of cancer from normal tissue. And this is really relevant for uh, men who come in with high PSA. The, the best thing in the world would be able to tell them, no, you're clear. There's no cancer that I can detect. Um, and so we can take these three parameters, which is somewhat difficult to visualize here, and actually resolve that down into a single score where everything to the right side of the positive score means completely normal by our measures. Everything to the left is uh, something that we have to deal with. We actually think that we can separate out the prostatitis through some uh, textural measures. Um, but this is all biopsy proven now, and so the, I feel very comfortable that those, those on the right can uh, avoid a biopsy, which in a prostate is just a, a really still a horrific procedure. Um, we've moved this into the liver. So this is a breath-held um, fingerprinting where you can uh, identify lesions um, just based on their T1 and T2 properties without uh, necessarily giving GAD. Um, this is in radiology right now at ISMR, and we'll show you some new data where we've expanded this to whole liver coverage and free breathing. Um, Jesse Hamilton in Nicole Cyberlick's lab has extended this to the heart. So this is uh, 16 breath-hold fingerprinting. Um, compared to the standard techniques. Um, this is an MRM right now, um, and we don't see any significant differences between these. Um, Jesse's also accelerated this recently to a four breath hold acquisition, or four heartbeat breath hold acquisition. Um, and so now in, in four heartbeats, we can get quantitative T1, T2, and it's a, we're working on corrections to that M0. So if you followed me up to now, um, let's think about some implications of this beyond just what I showed. Um, the biggest one is that um, sequence design is going to change, and it could change to the point where we have a simple scan button on the front, where we're not running different protocols, where we're just selecting, I want to scan for five minutes and hit go. Um, that would be true independent of field strength. So the relaxation values themselves would change between them, but the actual sequence that you run wouldn't. Obviously, that has big implications. In particular, at high field, um, we have real challenges that people, people here know. Um, and it fundamentally comes from this assumption, conventional imaging, that the fields are homogeneous. 
You know, in a, in a way we know that the B0 and the B1 fields are wildly inhomogeneous, but we always assume that they are homogeneous. And people have spent their whole careers fighting to make those homogeneous. Um, and so in a way you're fighting physics in a way here, you're fighting nature. Well, with fingerprinting, we actually don't have this requirement for homogeneous fields at all. All we have to do is know them. And, and it actually can help us in this spatial incoherence concept by making different places look different from each other. And so in a way here, physics helps us. Um, so we've, we've been working on this, but I'll show some data from across town. Um, this is uh, Martin Close's work where they've taken this um, and applied it to the different quadrature fields in a, in a uh, high field excitation. And um, I'm, I don't have time to really go in too much detail, but um, these are 7 T uh, data where uh, it's T1, T2, PD map required um, just beautifully, if you ask me. There, you don't see any of the B1 or B0 in homogeneities that you would see in other methods. So this is, this is fantastic in my mind. We also are, are immune to other errors. Um, and this is just like in conventional fingerprinting. So if you, you know, the FBI never gets the, you know, the, the murderer to perfectly do a, uh, a fingerprint on the glass, they, they always are dealing with partial fingerprints or smudges or, or whatever. And we have a slightly different way of uh, error propagation in fingerprinting as well, in MR fingerprinting. And this is the example I like to show. So obviously this is the letter A where we've added increasing Gaussian noise as we go from left to right. And the, the error at the top is essentially one over the SNR in this case. So we go from a perfect image over on the right that's an SNR of 0.3 is what we would say. And so if I asked you traditionally which image is better, you would say the left image is dramatically better than the image on the right. Does anybody want to disagree? Thank you. Um, if you ask a computer though, or ask if I ask you this question, what letter is shown in these images, you would all still get it right 100% of the time across the board, and so does a computer. And so to a computer, and to have the same quality our ability to recognize the letter is the same. That's dramatically different thinking than the kind of linear number that's given on the top. So in particular, this plays a role in motion. So this is a real-time display of what's going on in a fingerprinting acquisition. It's 15 seconds long, and about 12 seconds in, there's a 45 degree head rotation that should be coming right now. And so as Bruce showed really elegantly this morning, this should ruin your entire acquisition if you were doing conventional Fourier encoding. But in fingerprinting, we're doing something different. We're asking fundamentally, what is the most likely thing that is there out of these choices? Or what was there the most? And so without doing any corrections at all, these are the maps that come out from that data set. And you can see that the, the data where we did it without the motion, or that 45 degree rotation, the maps look the same because most of the time the volunteer had their head in the same spot. So this, we have to do a lot more work here, but this is a fundamentally different relationship than the old fashioned Fourier encoding that we do, we're used to doing. The other real big difference is that the signal evolutions are really different looking. So, in a conventional kind of acquisition, like I said, we're always dealing with these exponential functions. And in particular, if we take two exponential functions and add them together, we get a bi-exponential, but it is really difficult to tell that bi-exponential curve from a mono-exponential curve. So this is why we have this problem of partial voluming in MR, because the stuff that's mixed together all looks the same. Well, if in fingerprinting, this may not be the case at all. So this is, this is gray matter in CSF for one of our acquisitions. These look wildly different from each other, and the sum of them looks different than any of the, in any of the individual ones. And so what that means is that from that same data set, we can piece these apart. 
And um, this is work by Anaga Deshmani over the last three years. You can find it at ISMRM, and there, there should be a paper coming out soon as well. We're just directly from the same data where we're getting T1 and T2. We can get estimates of the volume fractions of CSF white matter, gray matter, for example. This is really useful for many things, um, you know, for quantifying disease. Um, you will see some data at ISMRM where we use those metrics to um, see some changes in uh, multiple sclerosis. But it can also be useful to give us synthetic images or calculated images that look more like uh, conventional acquisition. And this is in particularly true in flare. If we have a voxel that's mixed between, say, gray matter and CSF, that T1 value that comes out of that mixed value is wrong because we only assign a single T1 value to it. In fingerprinting, we can pull out the different pieces. We can find the CSF fraction, find the normal tissue fraction, and then sub do something like a CSF suppression in a way to get something that looks much more like a conventional flare than something where um, you haven't taken these partial volume effects into account. So in, you can see this in particular here on the posterior side. Um, but that's just one step of this where we're really moving towards is a more functional look at the, the um, components of a voxel. So we know that a voxel is made up in tissue at least of cells. So there's an intracellular component, an extracellular compartment, and um, maybe even more. But we also know that the water that we're imaging is exchanging. Or if, even if it's not the water molecule itself, the magnetization on the water molecule can, can change from one, one space to the other. And obviously this is really critical to a lot of diseases. In particular fibrosis in the heart, you see a, a big change in extracellular volume fractions. Um, this exchange rate is probably related to metabolism at some base level. So these, there's real value down here. Um, these maps are crazy, and I'll go back to my disclaimer that we still don't know how to visualize this stuff. But with fingerprinting now, we can make these six-dimensional um, ex uh, estimations of uh, intracellular, or, or let's just say a, a component A, T1 and T2 value, a component B, T1 and T2 value, their exchange rates, and their volume fractions relative to each other. And so this is a six-dimensional acquisition. We call this MRFX for MRF exchange. Um, this is about a three-minute acquisition for this slice. Um, and it looks like a bunch of noise, but let's just focus in, in particular, on the, these images up here. You can see that, that there's, uh, in this component, it's, it's sensitive to the gray matter, white matter um, areas. And so if we look at the T1 and T2 values, in particular in that white matter areas, what we see is that um, these, these values are for these two components. Here we see something that's really, really short, T1 and T2. This in particular indicates that it's very, very hard. Um, in white matter, that's probably related to myelin. Um, and then there's something that's long that could be cellular. This indicates some sort of cellular component. A and we see that the two tissues are exchanging. Um, so that, that exchange time matches what other people see for myelin. The water fraction, myelin water fraction matches. The T2, we're a little bit shorter, but it's effectively the same. Uh, and the, this, uh, this value here, this T1 value, is within the range of what we would expect. This actually matches um, data that's coming out of the NIH a little bit better than these other um, publications. And so this may give us insight into the really microstructural um, information that's going on in brain tissue and in all other tissues in the body. And again, I think in, in particular this exchange rate is going to be great for imaging cancer since that's the, the section of the talk that we're in. All right, so last but not least, I want to go back and rewind. I think I uh, have, have given you a, a wide swath of, of both physics, philosophy, and, and clinical data. Um, let's go back and deal with patients. Um, if I ask you about the, the, the um, requirements for this readout, there was only one that I gave, which was that it be pseudo-random in the sense that it has to vary um, throughout the whole acquisition. I didn't tell you that it had to obey any particular form. In fact, I showed you multiple different variants um, throughout this whole talk. So there's a lot of things in our world that are random. 
and there's some of them that are better than others and this is one that I really like so Yo-Yo Ma playing box cello suite number one and if you look at this on a millisecond time scale it's random in the sense that I can't predict it's going to go from this millisecond to the next so I could listen to that all day. So this is the uh, audio waveform there. So we can take that and use that as a basis for our acquisition. So we start by doing some data compression or conventional audio compression to make it so that it's not so spiky. And then we can design the entire sequence based around that audio waveform. And Dan Ma is going to be um, presenting this as part of the Young Investigator Award at ISMRM, so I'm not going to ruin her... Uh, or steal her thunder, I could say. But essentially, what we've seen is that we, um, as long as we're maintaining zero crossings in our audio waveform and maintaining um, the audio waveform as close as we can, we get something that actually sounds pretty reasonable. The, the, the bigger point, and I'll, I think I play you a result. Is it gonna come up? No, I need to, let me grab another talk. I don't know why, where the actual audio recording came in. Uh, that's embarrassing, I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's in here. You can see some of the different places I've talked about this. I was trying to go fast for today. So, this is the, uh, the beginning, we start with the regular audio. Those are the acquisitions over there. That's what it sounds like in the scan. So these, you know, this is, could be viewed as a little bit gimmicky, but I want to reinforce that we're getting those images from that acquisition. Um, and now I'm going to switch back to the other talk. Um, and so this is comparing that Bach Cello Suite 1 acquisition to what just I can promise you sounds horrific um, with this randomized spiral acquisition. This is the efficiency or the precision per unit time that we get out. And you can see for both T1 and T2, we've lost almost nothing. So we're at a 1% precision in T1 and about 1% precision in T2 in about a minute of acquisition, and it sounds like Bach. So I'll send it to you. Don't worry. <laughs> so again, we have a... We have a the, the loss here is processing time, I'll be honest with you, but that's just computer time. The, the physics and the philosophy of this, there's no loss. And so our clinical information should be the same. So just to prove this out, I think it's kind of dumb if you've heard it, but we took 10 volunteers who've never had an MR before and we put them in the scanner. We ran EPI, TSC, um, we did nothing, and then we ran that music sequence and asked them how comfortable they feel. Um, and obviously, we had a, a significantly better uh, response from the, the music than from the uh, conventional acquisitions. And these volunteers all came back for other studies and they asked, my God, where did the music go? And <laughs> <laughs> so just to wrap this back up, I think we, we've shown a feasible way that we can get numbers in MR. And we think that those numbers are gonna tell us something about disease. Uh, and so we, we hope that we're going to, through this, get better patient care. Better patient care from the pure healthcare side, but also better patient care from their experience when they come to MR. Um, and so with that, I just want to really acknowledge, I did not get here by myself. This is the, the group of, the, the, you know, the massive team of people that we have working on this. In particular, I want to really acknowledge Dan Ma and Yun Zhang, uh, Yong, Anaga, Jesse, these are the, I think that's all. Those are the real people who have done the, the physics work. And then Shivani and Sarah down here in this corner have done the lion's share of the, the clinical work. 
Um, and then, again, my long-term colleagues, Vikas and Nicole, who are still with me here in Cleveland. And also these folks who provided unbelievable insight in this project. Thank you all again for the invitation to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. was really uh, uh, excellent and very inspiring lecture, and there's really a lot of work to be done. And uh, are there any questions to Dr. Griswold? Yes, question? Hi, thank you very much for this work. It's amazing. I just have a, a question because it's also very challenging to translate this into the clinical practice. And I would like to know your experience, whether the radiologists really appreciate it or they still stay by their T2-weighted and T1-weighted images. So I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to give you a, a slightly uh, provocative answer, if I could. Um, I, I happened to be at Beth Israel back in the 90s uh, doing EPI work um, before Steve Warwick realized that you could um, see stroke with it. And we were doing T2-weighted EPI and cardiac EPI, and it all looked like crap, and nobody cared about it at all. The first second that you could make a new diagnosis, nobody cared about image quality anymore because they could, you know, do something new today that they couldn't yesterday. And I'm taking the same philosophy here, that when we can get to the point where we are providing diagnostic information that's not available in any other way, then we, we see that the clinicians change. So I can tell you in prostate, we don't scan a single prostate at our hospital or our whole healthcare uh, system anymore without fingerprinting. The uh, hospital president gave a talk two weeks ago about, he's new, he just came in, Dan Simon from, um, who used to be at the Brigham, for some of you may know him. Um, he uh, laid out the top three priorities for the healthcare system, and the number one was MR fingerprinting of prostate uh, becoming a clinical standard. So that's just the one insight um, that we've had there. Our uh, brain tumor, our neurosurgeons who deal with brain tumors, want that white matter separation that I showed so that they understand their, um, you know, the surgical planning before they go in. We're actually working with them on the visualization of that. I actually find that, that part of it really challenging. But that pure, you know, the, currently they're using DTI data for that, and which we know is really noisy and FA maps are not pretty by any stretch of the imagination. So if we can get them a higher resolution 3D, uh, map of just white matter, they're very interested in that in defining tumor margins and so on. So that's the pathway that we're going and I think it all comes down to just what you provide. The patients, by the way, will uh, like the music a lot. For so sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to ignore that. Okay. Yeah. Very nice presentation, Mark, as Thanks. usual. Um, so I have a question about motion. Yeah. So in order to move to clinical practice, I mean, probably we will need to have like a motion robust fingerprinting version, particularly yeah. to use it in the body. Mm -hmm. I got your point about the 45 degree head motion, but that's a really easy motion. Um, so what about like... It's pretty extreme though, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what about like non-rigid body motion uh, yeah. that comes from, res from respiratory motion, for example, if you're yeah. gonna try to do a liver imaging? Yep, yeah. so a um, couple of things there. Um, at ISMRM, uh, my postdoc, um, uh, who's, I can't even think of his name right now, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> there are so many of them. So many. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bairav Mehta will show um, using, uh, that, that you can do fingerprinting with some of the robust, exactly like what Bruce showed earlier, some of these robust fitting methods to, to get rid of the motion so that you get these essential signal outliers and they go away. So Bairav will have... Uh, I think it's a poster, e-poster on that. Um, also, our postdoc, Yong Chen, will show a um, navigator-gated um, liver uh, protocol. It's, it's around 10 minutes for coverage from, from up in the lungs down past the kidneys at about two millimeter, two or three millimeter, two by two by three, I think, is where we are right now. 
Um, and that's no parallel imaging, no compressed sensing, just based on the navigator gating. And you just piece apart the, the signals that you acquire in the same way. Um, I didn't mention this, but the, the cardiac example I showed, um, we actually take the gating information um, and record that and use that as the basis for the dictionary calculation. And we do the same thing in the, in the liver case, that if you have a cardiac rate variation, then effectively the timing of your sequence is changing, the sensitivity to all these parameters is changing, but all we have to do is know that and then we build that into the dictionary and everything's fine. Okay, great, thank you. So, so Mark, maybe I ask, uh, I guess the last yeah. question. Uh, so this is fa uh, fantastic and obviously, you know, I think leading to the, to the future. You mentioned something which I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, from you. You talked about that this technique does not require, I guess, hardware that is sophisticated. You, you gave an example of in homogeneity, yeah. what what other things um, this technique could could uh, could get better if let's say hardware changes? Do you do you f see that in in that area, or you actually don't care about where the hardware is going uh, in order for this technique to to become clinically feasible and robust uh, further? Well, let me maybe let me push it to to the two ends. Um, on one end, let's say that we're going to go to a twenty Tesla magnet. There's really good simulations out there that show that there's almost no, and I wish Chris Collins was here. Chris is not here, is he? No. Um, there's really good simulations that Chris did that show that you, you, if you're trying to drive a homogeneous bird cage or something like that into the body, that there's just no way at those field strengths of like 14 to 16 Tesla that you, that you get a homogeneous field inside. You always end up with these black bands. Um, what the guys down the road have shown um, very beautifully is that you can transmit inhomogeneously with these different coils, different inhomogeneous coils, none of them will have the same black band. And so if you piece all that information together, you can actually get a homogeneous looking image. And so I think if we want to have, if we want to go to high fields like 20 Tesla, assuming that we could build that, this is one of the few ways I see that we could easily get homogeneous diagnostic quality images out. Um, I think this will be key at 7T clinical when, when that happens. Um, on the other end, I think that we could start throwing away homogeneity from the magnet and start making things cheap and easy. Um, and so, you know, I have projects where we're talking about bringing magnets to Africa or flying them on the space station, and you have wildly different requirements for those, but um, you know, and conventional imaging just is not going to give the information there, but I think that we can design a fingerprinting type thing that will at least do, do greater than zero. Yeah, Tom Yvonne was here a couple yeah. of weeks ago and talked about the project. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thank you for coming, and uh, I'll give you a small gift, and doesn't play music, but... Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>